Good afternoon, everyone. Why don't we go ahead and get started? I want to make sure that I'm honoring um, uh, everyone's time together today. So thank you so much uh, for joining our webinar today. This is one in a series of webinars exploring dialogue as an effective tool for building school communities that are committed to the First Amendment, inclusion, equity, and belonging. This webinar series was made possible by generous support from the Templeton Religion Trust, Andrew and Julie Klingenstein Family Fund, and the Cousins Foundation. As we all know, this has been an extraordinarily difficult year. The deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd sparked protests around the country and around the world and renewed demands for racial equity and justice. At the same time, economic and healthcare inequalities were once again exposed as black and brown communities across the country were devastated by the pandemic. And then in March, the mass shootings in Atlanta highlighted the dramatic rise of violence and hate toward members of the AAPI communities. Educators across the country have been really grappling with how to help school communities process these events, especially in the politically charged environment that we find ourselves in, and also to find effective ways to advance racial justice. Today with us are three extraordinary educators who will all share some of their wisdom and experience in navigating these issues. I wanna give a very special welcome to Kiki Davis, Davey and Joe Wanger. We will begin today with short statements from each panelist as they reflect on their current role and work on these issues. And then I have a series of questions for our panelists and I will invite them to explore these and engage in dialogue together on them. And then we really wanna open it up uh, to you for your questions. And so uh, throughout the webinar, I hope that you will please put your questions in the chat function. And so without further ado, um, I'd love to invite Kiki to, to share with us a little bit about um, her work, her current role, and, and how she's really engaging in these issues. Thank you, Reverend Farrington. Good afternoon. Um, I am the Director of Equi uh, Institutional Equity and Diversity at St. Stephen's and St. Agnes School. Um, this is my 11th uh, year in the role at St. Stephen's and my 19th year as a diversity practitioner um, doing this work, um, this really invaluable work that we do with students and adults in our, in our schools. Um, my role at the, the school, I'm, I, I'm a part of the senior administration. Um, I report to the head of school and I say that because as we think about these roles, that's really a very important aspect of um, where you lie in doing this work and the work that can be done. Um, I work um, ES through 12, so our school is early saints, and those are about four-year-olds to 12th grade, and so I work across all three divisions. Um, I hit pretty much and engage with every constituency from students to, to our parent, our association of parents and teachers, um, our board. Um, we have a board uh, committee on diversity. I'm a part of that. Um, and our alumni and our admissions uh, departments. And so there's really not an aspect of the school that I do not touch. And that's because my main role is really to be a lens, right? To be accountable for the work being done and not being done as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, I serve as a primary resource and support for our faculty and our students and our parents. Um, I work closely with our director of teaching and learning and um, some of our faculty leaders around curriculum and professional development, constantly looking at what we do innately as educational institutions, and that is to teach, but how we teach and what we teach. So both content and pedagogy um, I work with. Um, I'm engaged in student programming. Um, one of my favorite parts of my job is to engage with the students. Um, strategic planning. Um, in addition to strategic planning. Um, but I, I think a, another really primary part of my role is um, student and faculty care. And so I, um, I try to maintain um, ample opportunities to engage with students about and, and faculty, especially those who identify as um, black and brown folks of color about their experience in order to make our school a better place, a more inclusive place, a place where everyone can see themselves belonging. And so that's really my primary role. And, and a big part of that, like I said, is, is creating those opportunities for the other adults in our community. Um, and 
you know, why is this important? Um, because it's really essential to learning. Like when we look at what it means to learn, um, this is an essential part to creating um, and maintaining a, a system of equity in our schools and, and beyond our schools. So we're raising the next generation of leaders. Um, this is where change starts. We believe it starts very young, um, early saints, three or four year old, where we're talking about these issues and giving them the schools and the, excuse me, the skills and the tools and the knowledge to go out and, um, and, and be the change that we want them to see in the world. Thank you so much, Kiki. And I know you work very closely uh, with Dave. So Dave, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and, and to talk about how you're really engaged in this work. Sure. So uh, my name is Dave Yi. Um, I, am a, um, I am an upper school English teacher this year, and I'll talk about what my, my role next year will be after I um, talk a little bit about what being a teacher, I suppose, looks like to me. And I think that what that looks like to me is um, largely being all over the place <laughs> at all at all times. And I think that, you know, being as involved in the different things that I am. So for this year, I've been involved in the, um, the writing of our um, all, all upper school DEIB focused advisory curriculum. Um, I have been involved in um, or I have uh, mentored our Asian affinity group. Um, I have taught five English sections this year. And so between, you know, all my classes I've taught, the only class year that I had not taught is 11th grade. Um, and then I'm involved in the live streaming and the putting together of all, uh, a lot of our performing arts events this year. And I think that being as involved as, as I am in, in all of those different corners of the school means that I get to see more of the school, at least the upper school division, than I would if I were uh, simply focused on what happens in my classroom. And I think that this is the most important part of DEIB work, is an understanding that every single educator has to have, that our classrooms, as much as we want them to be, are not sacred oases away from the tensions that students have outside of our classrooms. And because of my, uh, because of how all the different roles at the school pull me at different times, um, I'm able to see that complexity a little bit more. Applying direct, that directly to a lens of DEIB, it means that I can see that diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging is not synonymous with any of the different terms that are often used to capture it. It's not synonymous with race. It's not synonymous with sexual orientation um, or gender identity. It's not synonymous with uh, intellectual and learning differences. Creating a, a community where everyone belongs means creating a, a community where everyone belongs in all the different facets of life uh, that, um, that you as an educator and your students as students in the school inhabit. And that's why it's important for educators to engage in this work. Because if we don't engage in this work, then we have the, uh, we risk not seeing crucial part, uh, portions of our students or our colleagues. And we risk um, types of events where we learn in heavy retrospect, the harm that we've done in the past, um, as many educators over last summer did. As I move into my role next year, which is going to be the Director of Service Learning external engagement, and External Engagement, I feel that this work is even more essential because what essentially I will be hoping to do is preparing our students and faculty to engage in the world around them. And we need to know as people how to see people in their fullest lights and listen to them and their stories in all of their complexity. Thank you so much, Dave. And so Joe, um, you know, how is this similar and different from the role that you have and, and have had for many years? Uh, well, the truth is that Dave and Kiki and I work so closely together. I only have so much to add at this point. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll say that I'm, uh, I'm currently um, uh, serving, I'm an upper school English teacher uh, like Dave. I served as the department chair for that department for a decade before stepping down a couple of years ago. Uh, and one reason why I did step away is that I had started to do more work with Kiki as her, um, as the upper school coordinator for diversity and equity initiatives. And the truth is, is that I kind of got the bug and I just kind of was more and more involved with Kiki and the work that she was doing. Um, 
uh, as well as actually being a, a father of three, including two current students in our school, which gives me that lens through which I can see kind of why this work is important. Um, even though I teach on the upper school level, uh, of course, I have children at the lower school level too, so I can kind of see um, that broader perspective as well. Um, at the end of this summer, actually, I'm going to be stepping down from all the other positions that I've held in 14 years here and I become the associate director of institutional equity and diversity. So um, work even more closely with Kiki and, and be her partner um, uh, in the school. And I'm really excited for this work. And I think what calls me to this work in particular is the importance of white people to do this work. Um, and um, the necessity for white people to speak to white people when doing this work, because uh, it can be particularly fraught um, uh, when it comes to some of these some of these issues. Um, so I feel I feel called to that and kind of drawn to the empathy and courage necessary to do that work, um, and have been involved in that in the past couple of years with our, um, for example, our examining whiteness workshops that we've um, started running for our faculty and staff. Um, but I'll leave it at that because I know we have lots of other questions to answer and um, so we can move on from there. Thank you all so much um, for giving us a sense of, of your roles and, and how you're, you're currently engaged in this work. Now, Dave, you talked about um, an important part of this work is seeing and hearing, right? And um, we know that this past year has been extraordinary for so many different reasons. Um, I'd like you to reflect on that and give us some examples. Um, what have you been seeing? What have you been hearing? Um, how has this year really impacted our students, um, our faculty of color, um, our administrators, our parent communities? Um, I think it's always really helpful to have tangible examples and things that you day to day have been seeing and hearing and really dealing with in your roles. Yeah, I, I think that as a classroom teacher, like I, like I mentioned before, uh, the lives of our students creep into our classrooms regardless of, of which, uh, which discipline we, uh, we teach. Um, and so the constant kind of uh, awareness of a news cycle this year, a, domestic, uh, a news cycle of domestic events has meant that our students are probably more aware and more eager uh, to engage in these topics than at any point in my uh, career as an educator. Um, the events of last summer and the shooting of, or the, the killing of George Floyd right up through a couple of weeks ago and the, uh, the trial of Derek Chauvin, um, that uh, the conversation uh, is something that students have wanted to engage in Along the way, of course, other events such as the, um, the spot killings in Atlanta um, have had students wondering, questioning key things about the world around them. And I think that the, the most important thing for me to note as an educator today uh, for, for students is that students read our silence uh, as not necessarily a lack of comfort with the issue, uh, not necessarily not knowing ourselves, but they read our lack, our, our silence as an unwillingness to see the importance of those issues at times. And so um, this year, I've, I've really had to be aware of uh, the fact that when my students need space to speak, I need to see the needs of my students as pr uh, a priority over perhaps the needs of a particular curriculum as written or the visions or goals of a, um, of a discipline. And Joe, you've also been in the classroom um, a great deal, but then you also are a parent. And so I wonder um, those different um, experiences, what you've seen and heard. I mean, my, my children are young enough that they haven't, they they're not as as tapped into that <laughs> my oldest is eight my youngest is two um but i do you know at, at home i we do have conversations um at the very least about about race and about what is race and how we see race and how it impacts our lives and um 
you know, I think it's important, uh, again, especially for white parents too, to, um, to be open. And I think, I think we're still so, um, to think of things in, with a, a colorblind thinking is still so prevalent. Um, and, and it's, um, I know I've had these conversations one-on-one -on -one with any number of people, even in the last two or three years, um, to try and talk about why that's not helpful and um, why that actually can, that continues to be detrimental and um, not, you know, now we have this word anti-racist. That's, that's very much part of our common vocabulary, I think, in the last couple of years. And so talking to people about those things, I think, um, so talking to other parents about that too, whether that's on the sidelines at a soccer game, which sometimes that happens, or um, having those conversations with parents in our school community as well, um, or even my own parents, um, which I've done recently as well. Um, I, and I, I was gonna follow on with Dave too, I think about what he was saying about being a classroom teacher um, is it's, I think, there's been a new sense of urgency in the last year that I think um, perhaps is a silver lining of the pandemic as well. Um, just the ability to kind of make big, bold changes because we're forced into some. Um, that's 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 really been a positive of, this, of the last year and a half is that um, we feel uh, farther along in this work in some ways than I think we ever would have thought we would have been even a year ago. And uh, Kristen, you may remember the presentation that Kiki and I gave in, was it March of 2020? Uh, 10 days before lockdown. And we had aspirations that we were talking about in this presentation. And we, we could check off three of those five boxes already. <laughs> um, and so um, that, yeah, the new sense of urgency and the ability to kind of make these big, bold changes, I think has been um, a real blessing. Um, and Kiki, have you have you heard that? I mean, you interface with the board a lot, interface with a lot of parents, um, sometimes angry parents um, with administrators, um, and really moving this work forward. Um, so, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? Um, do you see this openness for kind of um, taking a bold step forward? I think the, the possibility for openness is there, right? I think there are a, a, a great amount of folks who really want to understand um, what they don't know they don't know. Um, and, and when I think about like, you know, you said earlier, the greatest impact, I think for, you know, folks of color, for black and brown folks, there was a sense of validation, right? Um, and, and people finally becoming um, willing to speak to, the lived experiences that we had had for so long, right? So a lot of this, uh, there was an awakening for some folks, but a lot of us have not only been awake, but we've been drudging through this, you know, sometimes in, in nightmare mode for, for years. And so I think for a lot of our students and a lot of the folks in our community, there is a sense of validation of, you know, what we had experienced was actually finally being seen and, and, and possibly being taken into account by, by the dominant culture, the dominant group. And I, I think, you know, as you know, you're right, there's always going to be that sense of resistance among folks whose lives change, right? They're, they're, anytime there's change, there's that fear of loss of what, um, if, if things are feeling the way they should for you, what does that mean for me now, right? And so there's always the, the, that, that fear of loss, right? Um, a lot of the isms are, are based around a fear of loss of power. And so I think a lot of the resistance is about um, losing a sense of normalcy, losing a sense of um, connection to a past that they have built on and created traditions around. And I think, you know, for, for black and brown folks and for those parents in our community, we, we were often not asked much about their experience, not asked how um, the curriculum was impacting them. And when they said something was often felt like they were not heard. Um, so I think that, um, like Joe said, I think that we've been awakened into this new sense of urgency. It's interesting that, you know, it's been, um, you know, 50 plus years since, you know, Martin Luther King talked about the, the urgency of now and, and we're still waiting for now. But I do feel like, you know, people and folks are now saying, not what are we saying we're going to do, but let's see what's going to happen. And so I think the impact has pushed us to act, right? And, and, and all these years of independent schools that have brought in folks to create diversity, we haven't done the work about what it means to be in community with people who are 
um, from various and differing backgrounds and cultures and perspectives. And I think now um, over the summer with, with the black at in the, in the, in the black summer and, and the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey um, events and murders, it has pushed us, right, to um, see what we have, where those gaps are and, and what is the work that we have to do that we haven't done. Because primarily many of our institutions were built on this, right? We were not created for the demographic we've had. So this has pushed us to look at the who the we are in, our, in the communities is um, differently than I think before. So I'm uh, just picking up on that thread of um, action. Um, you know, this webinar and, and this webinar series is really looking at the role of dialogue and knowing that dialogue is just one of many tools, um, but but an important tool um, in, in helping to build kind of safe, brave spaces to have these difficult conversations because all of this work, um, you know, uh, you need to have really uncomfortable conversations sometimes, but you need to be able to create spaces to be able to do that. And so, um, Kiki, where are the spaces that, that you've been really intentional um, about um, creating um, kind of safe and brave spaces and, and really tried to bring the tool of dialogue in? If you could talk a little bit about that, that would be yeah, great. Absolutely, and I think intentionality is the key word here. Right, because I think many of these conversations were happening; they just weren't um, constructive or effective, um, and we couldn't really curate them in a way where we could um, ask people to the, apply them to what they were doing in our community, whether they were students or faculty. And so, I think um, you know we had done this kind of um, a little deliberately and a little intentionally, but not naming it as a source of dialogue skills, right? In this dialogue program. But we have for many years had affinity groups, those safe spaces for folks who identify outside the dominant culture. Um, we had uh, Joe mentioned examining whiteness. Um, that was a, a space for dialogue with um, our faculty and adults in our community who identify as white, right? So they, they can talk about whiteness in a safe space, right? That gives them the opportunity to grow and learn. Um, and, and I will just say that, you know. You know, I, I am a believer that you create these safe spaces in order to transform them into brave spaces so that the safe spaces aren't a place where you're meant to stay. They're a place where you're meant to learn, um, grow knowledge and be empowered to go out and to have the conversations in spaces that you don't maybe feel as um, comfortable in, but you you create that that sense of braveness in there. Um, but we so we've had affinity groups. We've had um, examining whiteness. We've had, you know, affinity groups for all, uh, you know, in all three divisions, lower, middle, and upper, we have them for parents and faculty. So we've created those safe spaces, but I think we were intentional about looking at how um, this year we created a, a, a program called family groups. So all of our adult um, in our community were assigned to a family group where we had um, specific and intentional conversations around race, racial identity and racial justice. Um, getting to have those conversations with folks who came from different backgrounds to hear how race um, and their racial identity impacted who they are and how they walk through the world and part of that world being our community, right? And how they function as a, a um, their role in our community, whether a teacher, administrator, staff, um, and, and hear about the lived experience of folks who don't look like them, right? And so that was the safe space we did this year um, with faculty. We also created, um, I think Dave had mentioned, Dave maybe and Joe had mentioned our, our DEIB, our Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Belonging Advisory Program in the upper school. We, um, we created a structure and format so that all of our students would um, get an opportunity to be exposed to and learn these dialogue skills, right? In a way that we thought was um, beneficial for creating respectful discourse um, in this space and beyond this space, right? So the, the main point is that we want folks to be able to learn how to talk to each other and you can insert any content into that. So it was really about creating those dialogue skills and that you could learn to um, have a respectful discourse disagree with folks and still learn to be in community with each other. Um, and that was something we did in upper school, but it's also something that was mirrored in the middle schools through their Saints Advisory Program, which is their advisory program. They again talked about the, con the topic of race. As you can see, we had a theme this year of, of race, right? That we were gonna be very intentional again and deliberate about not um, blurring it out with 
all areas, right? But we wanted people to, to hone in and talk about something that may have been uncomfortable. And we did the same thing in lower school with a program called Weekly Wonderings, where in their morning meeting, they do um, culturally responsive te um, uh, teaching down there. Um, and in their, in their morning meetings that they would um, get a picture or a prompt and they would wonder about it, right? They wonder who's in it, what they're doing, what this means. And so we're starting at the very youngest and having these conversations about what it means to create dialogue, talk to each other, listen to each other, actively listen to each other, ask the right questions. And so setting up those spaces that were not voluntary, those other things that we talked about, that I talked about earlier were voluntary, examining whiteness, um, the affinity groups, but this was a place where we said as an institution, we think it's important to have these conversations. We're gonna set this time aside. We're gonna give you the resources to do it and we're gonna create the program around it. So that's what we did this year. Um, and we, we hope to extend that and expand that with professional learning groups next year, for, at least for our adults. Yeah, I just wanna follow up just one question with that. Um, I've had a lot of educators ask me, well, how do you create a safe space? Mm -hmm. um, and so what are, when you think about that, what are some of the steps that educators could do when thinking about that? What, what does that mean? And what are some of the steps to doing that? And then to get into a brave space? Right. I think you first have to uh, have a set of um, intentions, right? Um, community norms or whatever you want to call them, but you have to have a goal, right? And the goal is learning. And, and, and we were very clear that I understood that people were at different places on their journey and that was okay. That our goal was not for someone to start somewhere and end somewhere, but to progress, right? And that they move forward on their journey and that all you needed to do, and I say this in, in a lot of my workshops, is come with an open heart and a willing spirit and we'll provide the, the rest for you to do the work. Um, and so I think having people going in, knowing that there's no expectations of what you know and what you believe, um, is really important. And so setting those community norms of um, respect and, and, and um, withholding judgment, right? Um, I use a seedism, seed is seeking educational equity and diversity for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, there's a seedism called no shame, no blame, no guilt, right? And to create a safe space, you have to have people open up and feel like they can be vulnerable without judgment. Um, and, and I think that that's really important in, in that this is a place to make mistakes. Um, this is a place to experience discomfort. Whenever you experience discomfort, that tells your body that there's something wrong and there, there's, there's a change that needs to happen, a shift in something, you know, whether it's physical or mental or emotional. So it's a place where all of this is welcome and encouraged, right? Where this is the mistakes. And when you do that and you, and you get um, away from the fear that so much of these conversations provoke, and the anxiety that so much of these conversations evoke, um, then people will feel like they, they have gotten the skills and they're competent to take that outside of this safe space and have these conversations with folks that they may not have created this, this safe space with, right? It's really, again, it's just like we do for the students, it's a skill development, right? Once you know how to do it, you feel more competent. And this is really is about cultural competency. We haven't really used that term a lot, but this is really is about, about establishing a cultural competency, the ability to do this regardless of where you're at and with whom you're speaking. That's super helpful. And, you know, to talk about um, this is skill building, and these are skills that we are wanting our students to become um, very competent and co confident and competent um, in using not only our students, but also, you know, our faculty members as well. So I know, Joe and Dave, that, that you've been very intentional about bringing dialogue skills in into your work. Um, so what has that looked like? And, and um, where are the spaces uh, where you've been intentional uh, about helping um, students um, and faculty build those skills? You wanna go ahead, Dave? Uh, no, you can start this one, actually. <laughs> um... I feel like you've been the main author of the advisory program. I want to give you that credit. Um, well, I mean, I would say, you know, just to just to kind of spell out what this advisory program is that we've done that we've created this year. Our advisory program has always been present in our as long as I've been in the school. Um, and in the upper school, essentially the role is that every faculty and staff member has, say, somewhere between six to eight students that they um, they, they, they become their advisor when they're ninth graders and they stay with them through the upper school. So ninth through, ninth through 12th. Um, and you see each other multiple times a week. You would sit together at chapel and assemblies. Um, and then you have you kind of like a weekly check-in. And 
in, in Lucid's terms, the advisor's role is to kind of be a uh, just another adult advocate for those children on campus, uh, those students. Um, and you can imagine that there's there can be some very unique bonding opportunities in this setting because you're not necessarily their teacher. You are just another adult that gets to know them, that kind of gets to be their advocate. And you're your own unique little group in some ways too, um, as, that, as that advisory. Um, and we, we create kind of other sort of kind of um, bonding activities throughout the years to, that we work in advisories. Um, so it's a, it's a unique aspect of the school, at least something that I didn't have in my, in my high school education. Um, and so with this year um, in, in our, in our um, desire to be more intentional in this uh, work of DIB and as well as this, the dialogue skills, we created a whole new um, regular meeting for this advisories that we literally call DEIB advisory. And um, they were done in advisory pairings. So every, every advisory has a buddy advisory, buddy advisory. So you would have two adults and somewhere between you know, 12 to 16 students perhaps. Um, and we created an entire curriculum um, just for those, those advisory meetings. And they were roughly once a week. They were longer than our normal advisory programs, about the length of a class period, roughly. Um, and the, the heart of it was, the, the, was dialogue skills. The heart of it was looking at this as a skill set. What does this, what does this actually look like? Um, how does this work? What are the exact skills? What are the principles behind it? And then race became the topic as it was an important um, theme and topic for this year for this work. Um, and so race was the focal topic. And um, so it, would, it also involved kind of um, creating a common vocabulary for this. And I, and, I, and I say this only in the sense that I think that's really important for the dialogue skills, depending on what you're discussing is make sure that you have the, the common vocabulary. Um, and in this way, um, focusing on it uh, as a skill set in some ways diffuses some of the per perhaps the most um, contentious elements of it because the whole idea is well we're focused on this this skill and we're just using these topics in order to practice this skill um, and then something that Kristen you kind of alluded to I, that I think was also the beauty of this program was that it was also for the adults that all of the adults were doing this work too and um, dialogue skills and certainly discussing race were, are not necessarily something that was part of um, my education when I was younger. When I was 15, I wasn't getting this. Um, and so I feel like it's been one of the great elements of this program is that it's hitting all the adults as well as the students. And it's bringing, I think, um, a healthy vulnerability into that work because uh, this is challenging. and, and um, almost everyone's vulnerable when you're when you're getting into difficult conversations. And I say healthy in the sense that um, I think it's good for teachers to not always be the expert in the room. <laughs> um, and I think that it encouraged some particularly productive dialogues. Um, at least I can speak from my my experience with the, um, the students I worked with. Um, and so I think that was just there was in some ways that there was this kind of an almost an exponential element to what, what we got here is that we were kind of hitting so many different constituents and um, and, I, and I think it was it was clunky in some ways because we were kind of um, you know writing as we went along and this is a whole new thing we kind of just dove in um, but I really do feel that in the end it's been a, a net positive um, and I'm looking forward to kind of we're going to now further develop this program it's going to be a six through twelve and we're really going to kind of put some work into it um, and it's like I said, it was something that, you know, um, because COVID disrupted everything, we were able to kind of do this. And now hopefully it's something that we can kind of just really embed into our school culture and grow from here. And to, to follow up on what, what Joe said, I think that the reason why I wanted Joe to go first actually is because I, uh, um, I took a little bit of a sabbatical from the school uh, last year. And so I, I actually wasn't around for kind of the, a lot of the summer where the, um, the groundswell kind of developed around uh, needing to mobilize around this. Um, but when I, when I did come back in the fall and I, I saw kind of what was happening and what we were doing, I think that it captured perfectly something that has echoed in my mind um, since I became an educator. Uh, uh, a piece that I um, that I read when when I was studying to be become an educator, and that's David Hawkins's "I Thou It," 
um, the idea that every moment uh, for us as educators is not just a dialogue. I think it's so easy to think that dialogue means what's on my mind and what's on your mind, and we kind of negotiate that. Uh, and it's not just, uh, our classrooms are not just kind of content delivery uh, systems. They, it's, the idea isn't just to take facts and to put it into this head of the student that exists somewhere in some abstract way. Instead, there's a triangle of movement where we have each individual, the I, the teacher, the thou, the student, and then we have up here some aspect of the curriculum, some, some idea of a world or topic beyond either of those two figures, individual comprehension. And in between, that negotiating space is dialogue. How we move from me to you, how we move from facts to us, how we deal with all those different things is dialogue. And because there's so many pathways within that triangle, at times we don't know what the right balance is. You know, Sometimes we over-engage the facts and we under-engage the people in the room. Sometimes we over-engage the people in the room without grounding that back out into the, the other end of the triangle. But the fact of the matter is we're all in that triangle. And I think that that is the, the core because we're all in that dialogue. We're all in that negotiation. And that is the core of the work this year, not only to see it as a part of our DEIB advisory program, but the recognition of the fact that we're, we're all in that kind of space together outside of that DEIB uh, curricular program leads to the creation of the brave spaces that Kiki was talking about, because once you realize that symmetry, it's hard to keep it suppressed into that one space. And that's the gradual goal for all of these things to, uh, to start to root themselves in other places, even though we started with the intention for one place, um, because that's where the grassroots movement uh, starts. That's where we become uh, the, um, the inclusive, uh, community that we wish to be. And it's been a beautiful process to watch that unfold, um, but it certainly hasn't been without pain along the way and, and pushback and barriers. And um, so there are two things, two threads that I, I want to explore a little bit. One is, um, you know, we're not doing this work in a vacuum, right? I mean, um, we are constantly hearing um, from members of the community and members of the community exist in a very um, politically polarized environment. So racial equity work is, you know, um, very polarizing right now. And uh, the school community, as in many school communities, um, is pretty diverse. Um, in terms of, um, you know, kind of uh, political differences, ideological differences, religious differences, um, and, and approaches. And so, Joe, how have you seen the community really navigate this? How, uh, and has it been successful? Has it not? Um, because I know that, that there's a lot of fear that, that has been in all of this work. I mean, I think it has been successful. I think, um... <laughs> Kiki's probably gotten a lot more emails than I've, than I've seen, or, or the, our head of school's probably seen a whole lot more emails too. And it'd be fascinating to ask our head of school that question. Um, I think what's what's really helpful is it's something I think I, met, I, met, I mentioned when I last spoke, which is thinking about, first of all, that this that this dialogue skill is something that's apolitical. It's it's simply a skill set. Um, it's, you know, it's, um, I think Dave, Dave frame it really well that just it's part of education really um so uh where obviously where there has been some contention then would be um what the topic focus has been and i would say most of what i've heard has had more to do with kind of this um too fast but too too much too fast too soon um which as kiki alluded to is an age old <laughs> saying um <laughs> And to be to be honest, too, that's something that we only really have heard from white families, um, and we are a predominantly white institution. Um, but we also are um, we're an independent school, and we're an Episcopal school, and we have a mission statement. And um, some of this is spelled out in our mission statement. So in some ways, it's really just about kind of living the mission, which is something that I think any institution that has a mission statement 
always wants to be saying, we're living the mission, we're walking the walk. Um, and so I think that there has been, there has been growing pains, um, but I think ultimately it has, it has been successful. I think, I've, I think um, not hearing things about this in this situation is good. I think if people really felt a certain way about it, they would probably hear a lot more. Um, that's probably true, uh, both in independent and public schools. <laughs> so I want to talk about some of that pushback and, and where you're seeing that. And so um, Dave and Kiki, where specifically are you seeing pushback and what does it look like? Joe has alluded to some of it. Where have you seen it and, and how have you really navigated it? Are, you know, going to the mission statement, absolutely, um, fundamentally important. Are there other things that, that you've used um, to, to navigate those really tough conversations or pushback with students, um, pushback from teachers, pushback from parents, pushback from, um, you know, others, um, stakeholders in the community? Yeah. So I, I want to actually reflect a little bit on uh, a comment that, that Joe made there that um, in some ways he's, he's right, absolutely. Um, I think in, uh, in the broader picture of things, if our school were to have implemented something like this five years ago, I would have expected you know, an overwhelming amount of pushback. And, and there has, it's not like we've been devoid of pushback this year, um, but largely it's been a little bit more silent than maybe I was even expecting. I, I think that on one hand, that is a recognition of, uh, on the part of a lot of people that this is important work, uh, regardless of whether they understand its importance and can articulate its importance. Uh, or if they understand the complexity of it. Um, there is a recognition on a large portion of people's uh, minds that this is important work, we need to devote the time to it. I think though, this is where I want to lead into pushback. I think there are other people out there who I really wish would push back actually sometimes. I really wish they would say what's, what's on their minds, what their discomforts are, um, that they, don't agree or don't understand um, this work, because I think that although there are obviously cases where we as educators or we as people in schools have encountered pushback that goes nuclear, um, there are more often opportunities for pushback to come our way and then for us to engage those, uh, those parties with our dialogue skills, with um, the actuality of our goals and intentions to make it very, very clear that we're not looking to indoctrinate, we're not looking to silence any other um, you know, uh, perspective on a certain topic. Uh, instead, we are looking to accomplish these very clear and published goals that maybe you know, just weren't communicated or you had missed in, in some other way. But now we can talk about those things and we can talk about rather, rather than talking about whether someone or something is valid or invalid. We can affirm the validity of people, we can affirm the validity of topics, and we can discuss the execution, how that reached you. Because I think that that execution of, of how we make our communities more inclusive is something we're all willing to work on. That's why we're in this work. And anyone who wants to voice their opinion and lend their hands to that, even if they come from uh, or they're predisposed to a different opinion or perspective uh, than, than our own, we, we generally you know, welcome that. Um, however, uh, I think that the, uh, and, and on, on that note, I think that this year in the conversations that I've had with um, students and parents uh, and faculty members largely, um, have gone well because we've been able to come to that common understanding. Um, however, I, I do want to say, as far as pushback goes, there, there is a, there's a limit <laughs> to, um, to how, how we can engage in a, still in a productive way. And I think that the recognition on, on our part that a conversation is becoming too fraught uh, too emotional, too, uh, too much on the level where we're not listening to each other anymore. Um, that recognition in that moment and that ability to say, 
we're not ready for this conversation yet. And we can pause this conversation and come back to it later. We can create the space for us both to diffuse is as important a skill in navigating this as directly engaging, explaining and diffusing it in that moment. And I was just gonna add, I think, you know, that's exactly right. I was just actually what Dave just said. I think there's a point of listening is important to push back, hearing perspectives, but also knowing who you are as an institution and why you're doing it, right? And so that there's limits into negotiation. There's no negotiating whether we're gonna do this or not, we're gonna do this. This is because this is who we are and you trust us to teach physics in a certain way and you need to trust us to teach this, right? And so there's a trust that uh, parents give going into communities like this. And I think that you have to just be very steadfast and, and, and firm and um, what you believe as an Episcopal school, this is a really a huge part of our Episcopal identity. Um, as a um, as, as a school that values diversity um, and, and educational exploration and acumen, this is a part of what we do, exposure to different ideas. Um, and so I think that I think the part that a lot of institutions are having trouble with with pushback is either being too hard or too soft on it, right? I think there's a middle point where you're saying like, I'm, I'm willing, I'm, listen, I will take a phone call from anyone. And then I will tell them how wrong they are. No, I'm joking. But I will, well, I will tell them what we believe, right? And it will be not what I believe as Kiki Davis, but what we believe at St. Stephen St. Agnes. And this is what they've signed on to. And give them that option. You know, a lot of times parents realize that this, maybe this is not the place for them. And I think institutions have to be ready for that. But I think you negotiate only so much. Um, you never negotiate who you are, um, how you live within your mission, um, how you care for kids, the decisions you make about what you think is in their best interest. Um, and this is about um, the whole community, right? And, and institutions have not been seeking and see, seeing to um, the whole community um, as we look at the history of a, a lot of independent schools and you know their, their relationship to uh, white supremacy structures and, and oppression of um, other folks. So. Yeah, I think you just have to know who you are, be who you are, state that fact, and, and try to get people to, to come along and be gentle, be gentle and gracious. Yeah, and I mean, like Kiki said, I, I absolutely, I, I think that somewhere in writing has to be what you are or who you are and what you believe in. Uh, if, that's, if that's not in writing, then it needs to be in writing in order to navigate any of this. Um, if it's in writing and you don't agree with it anymore, then it also needs to be addressed um, because that's that's very possible as well. Um, but it makes these um, these conversations where we are looking to do something very very uh, brave and potentially controversial. Uh, it makes these conversations uh, much more grounded uh, if that is there to lean on. I just want to at this point remind people if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat function. And as you're doing that, um, so Kiki, what's at stake if we don't do that? What what's at stake if communities, you know, decide not to take this on because it seems too big, or I feel like don't they don't have the expertise, or what what's at stake um, for for schools, for for communities, for for students, um, for faculty. You know, everything, right? I think the way schools um, function, I think, you know, as we look at, especially, you know, I, I'm a West Coast, so I, you know, I, I got my start at independent schools on the West Coast, and many of them are much younger than our East Coast um, brothers and sisters here. But, you know, we, we know that a lot of our schools were not built for the demographic that they have now, but the demographic is changing, right? The expectations of who's in the community are changing. The, the exposure and the awareness of what is happening and, and what we've missed in the gaps have, have changed, right? People are awake, people have been awoken, right? To, to what is the possibility and what we should be doing. I think that there is you know, pedagogy and, and theory and practices um, that has been sus substantiated and sustained in, in, in really important places that says that this work has to be done because we risk harming the very community that we've been in, put in charge of to, to, to grow and, and nurture and heal, right? And so understanding the trauma that came from not doing this work, the gaps that have um, created um, a long lasting 
painful reminders of um, oppressive uh, systems and racist systems um, will be continued, right? We will perpetuate that if we, um, if we choose to ignore um, what is happening in our schools, what is happening with our students. Um, you know, teaching and education is about how students learn what they need. It's not about what feels good to us or what our experience were. And I think that's been the hardest part is for people to be like, but this wasn't my experience. And I'm like, well, this isn't your school, right? Um, this isn't, we're, we're dealing with that. So what's at stake? Everything's at stake, right? Um, I think we have a new de demographic of, of, of BIPOC of families who are expecting the same thing from these institutions that um, their white counterparts have long e expected, right? Um, there's, a, there's a letter going around now for families of color in response to the letters that have been going out from um, predominantly white, white families about pushback on this work. And their families of color who are, who are gathering their power to say, just as much as you think that this is not a part of what we should be doing, we know that this is an imperative to creating a safe space for our kids who are part of our communities, right? Um, and so I, I, I actually think that you cannot consider yourself a, a good institution, an institution that is um, looking to educate the whole child and every child if you are not doing this work as a part of a curriculum. Um, it cannot be something you do when you have time to do it. You have to be intentional and deliberate. You have to have expectations for every adult in the community. Um, you have to um, provide um, space for um, different beliefs, but also have a set of um, behaviors and expectations around comportment that are non-negotiable in doing this work. I've got two wonderful questions uh, from, our, um, from our audience. Uh, so the first question, did DEIB advisories also serve a mental health function for students, especially during the pandemic school year? Um, I, I, yeah, I would say yes, in the sense that it's part of the larger advisory program. Um, and, and actually our, our school, I'm trying to remember if it, I think it was last spring already, um, our, the counselors, the mental health counselors on the on divisions actually made an explicit point that advisors pay particular attention to their advisees. Um, and last spring, when we were kind of adapting to the, the, the early stage of the pandemic, we added another advisory meeting for that actually strictly for mental health purposes, really, just like another check-in just to see how it's doing. And, and the sense was that advisors in particular should be attuned to their advisees' mental health. Um, so um, the answer is yes for the, the entire advisory program of which the DEIB advisory is mainly just one part of it. Um, I, I, I guess I would also say that there's, I, I, what, what I thought of when I saw that question too was how at the, at the end at the end of our cycle this year we we did something we've never done as a school which is we did these affinity groups um, where literally the entire upper school faculty and students um, were put into advisory or, I'm sorry affinity groups based on how they identified self-identified um, their race and I know that um, and, and Kiki, you could speak to this, but I just remember talking to you about how your affinity group went. I feel like it served a mental health function, function, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it was a space where kids could felt like they could breathe, where they weren't on, where they didn't have the, the, the pressure, even though we tried so much not to do that. I think black and brown folks have always felt in these spaces, in mixed spaces, that there was some um, uh, culpability for them to speak if no one else spoke or to defend the uh, um, a, an idea or a topic or uh, a you know an event um, and so that mental health was giving them a day off right it was really giving them a mental day off to say for once I don't have to defend what I believe I don't have to defend my experience I don't have to answer why I believe this um, I'm just believed because there is an affinity. So absolutely, I think that the affinity spaces were a great opportunity for mental health. And also, I, I wanna say, I think that um, as designed, the DEIB advisory spaces were intended to be very clear about what the goals of, of each session were. And ideally those goals would have been customized to the specific needs of the students that are in that room at that time. And I think if, uh, if looked at in that way, no other class 
uh, that the students will have over the course of their, uh, their schooling is as directly responsive to the needs of the people in that room. Now, I think because of the fact that this is a different teaching paradigm, uh, and in fact, we tried not to call it teaching at all, we tried to call it facilitating um, and emphasize the fact that our advisors were facilitators. Um, because it's so different though, and because our uh, teachers were code switching often between facilitating and teaching, I don't think that that opportunity was taken up as much as, um, as it could have been this year. But ideally in a, in a future uh, model, we would orient the program to be that time when not only are the students exposed to ideas that maybe they wouldn't have consider, considered themselves, but they're exposed to in a space that's customized directly to what their curiosities and what their learning styles are. I have another question and I'm very mindful of our time, um, but I think this is a really important question. Um, so Kiki, I wonder if you would be willing to take this. Um, so what right do we have uh, to impose our values on established institutions rather than tailor making our own institutions? Um, if you could take that and then we will begin to, to wrap up with final reflections. Thank you. That is a, a great question and a question that I hear in a lot of my affinity spaces. Um, and I will say this, I believe, and I think I hear it um, kind of parrot it from a lot of the institutions that I've been a part of, especially independent schools, um, this idea of community, right? And I believe that a community is created by the people in it, right? And so um, it, it, they're not static places. And so it's not about a, it's not about imposing our values on an established institution. Institutions are constantly changing. They're, all, they're constantly changing their practices and, and the things that are right in the moment and doing things differently, right? Because they're based on who's there. I think the problem is, is that we, and I speak from the uh, African-American person perspective, have not always been seen as a part of the we of community, right? And so um, as far as imposing our values, I think that the values are built up by the people in it, right? And and um, and certainly inst in institutions impose their values and honor codes and you know um, and, and standards of behavior all the time. And so I think by saying that this is important to me, if you are if you are saying that I am a part of your community, then to be truly inclusive as a as a as an institution, we have to um, adapt. And, and, and create those opportunities to fold those into who the school is, right? The school is only a, a mirror of the people in it, right? Um, you take them out and, and they're just a whole bunch of really old um, traditions that don't stand up to the time or the need of the students that are there. So um, I'm all for, you know, establishing old institutions, but while we're in these institutions, if, if they're going to take our diversity and put it on their web pages, and if they're gonna take um, and, and, and take our kids and put them on their teams and, and on their, you know, their, um, their robotics uh, uh, teams and things like that, then we have every right and, and, and it should be almost expected that our values are woven in and become a part of that institution. Wonderful. Kristen, can I speak to that? And maybe I'll wrap that up into my, uh, my final thoughts as well. Well, thank you. Um, so, I think that the, the last part that, um, that Kiki said uh, especially speaks to me especially. Um, ever since I've been in independent schools, I remember the first time I got an independent school job, I took home the school newspaper and I, I showed it to um, you know, my, uh, an advisor that I've been working with. And he looked at the headline, it said, uh, you know, such and such school seeks to increase diversity. And then he flipped it over. He said, oh, hires Dave Yee. What a, uh, <laughs> and so he was, he was obviously joking in, in that moment, but I, I think that for the longest time then, independent schools have stated how much they want diversity. And more broadly, spaces that are predominantly white have stated how much they want to increase diversity. And I think that as, you know, part of that diversity um, uh, that, that steps in, in the door, I, I think for me at least, I was always sold the bill of goods that I would get to contribute to the community in whatever way met my strengths and my experience. 
that I would have an honest shot at making this community great or better than it, than it was. And, and so I don't necessarily see um, this work, any of this work um, as imposing our values. I think that uh, I see it as, as we were invited either implicitly, whether uh, intentionally <laughs> to contribute these ideas to our community. This is uh, the reason why uh, we're important members of our community, not because we look great on the website or an admissions brochure, but because we bring our voices uh, to this work. And we get to make sure that the words that we have on our websites actually mean the same thing to all the people in our building and all the people that surround us. Thank you, Dave. And so now I would invite um, Joe and, and Kiki and Dave, um, any final reflections? Um, and maybe you can think about if, if there are people who are just starting this work, you know, maybe where they can go or resources that have been helpful for you um, uh, in this work as, as you've really engaged it for many, many, many years, but, but really um, at a different level this year. Thank you. Oh, okay, I'll start. I, I mean, the resource thing is tricky because there's a lot out there, right? Um, and I think it's one thing as I've gone gotten deeper into this work, I, I feel like at least I've covered enough resources that I can start to help people vet and kind of where it's a good starting point. Um, and Kiki's played that role for me too over the years. I think I literally like three summers ago or something, Kiki said like, what book should I read? <laughs> and you had like two... Um, Two on your head. You have you have. We can't teach what we don't know, right? By Gary Howard and um, Understanding White Privilege by um, uh, Kendall Kendall. Wait, uh, Kendall White. No, that was our dean of yep. students. Um, Francis Kendall. <laughs> Francis Kendall. Francis. Um, but I, I actually I would I, I would say for somebody who's starting in this work, I, I would say before you are, you're cracking books or podcasts, and there's some great stuff out there, right? I feel like go to a conference. <laughs> I mean, I know for me, and I've been in conferences with Dave and Kiki, there's something about doing this work in, in community with others. There's, um, that's, I think, going to make more of a difference than any podcast or book or documentary or, or whatever could make um, and start there. And there's, there's so many of those conferences and workshops out there um, from any number of institutions. Um, so I, but just go do it with someone, do it with colleagues. Um, do it with friends or whoever it is, but go do it with other people. And I feel like that's, um, that's going to get the ball rolling in a whole different way. Yeah, and I would just add, know where you're starting. I think um, schools are at different places um, and know what your, um, the, what your support is, uh, where your head of school, where your board stands. Um, um, do an assessment of the folks in your community and um, what they know and what they don't know and what they're ready for. I think the worst thing you could do is jump in and pushing people um, in a way that um, alienates them. And, and for those who know me, that does not mean that you don't do the work because people aren't ready to do it. it I think that it means knowing your community, what they're ready for and what's going to what's gonna get you the biggest bang for your buck. And so that, that's a lot of times finding your people. Um, we often call it the choir in my line of business. Um, and um, I was just reading Tim Wise, who's another great resource, but he said, even the choir needs practice. So getting those people to be on the same page. Um, we talked about consistency of language, consistency of um, purpose, um, get a purpose, get a mission um, of what you want, set some goals, set some doable goals about um, information. And, and yeah, NAIS has a great um, a conference. They have a lot of set of conferences if you're just doing this work. And I, lastly, I would say, know that this is a journey. I had a kid say to me, he came back from Student Diversity Leadership Conference and said, remember, Ms. Davis, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I said, thank you. Thank you after 20 years for telling me that. But, um, but I do think that you have to remember that this is a journey um, and that different people are entering at different places. Um, different schools or at different places, find the school that's like you and, 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 and collaborate them and then find the school that's slightly above you and look at some of their best practices. And then find that school that's struggling, right, to make you feel better about what you're doing and the progress you're making. I think just knowing what's happening around you um, and what the possibilities are, um, it's going to be really important if you're just starting this work. Dave, any final words? Yeah, I, I mean, I want to... Um... 
uh, echo what uh, Joe and Kiki said, and I want to kind of pull at a thread that I think uh, uh, permeated both of their comments. Uh, it's about starting with people. Um, you need to know the people around you that can help you. You need to know the people who will help you into the future. You need to talk to the people that challenge you. Those people contain within them the access to the resources maybe that you'll, you'll need to look at down the line. Um, and also by grounding yourself in people first, you realize what the stakes eventually are. The stakes are not for a certain set of facts or understanding. The, cert, uh, the stakes are for those same people uh, that, that you're talking to, whose truth you need to come to a better understanding of and needs to be affirmed in a broader way. Thank you so much, Kiki Davis and Davey and Joe Wenger. And um, this webinar series uh, was made possible um, by the incredible support of Templeton Religion Trust, Andrew and Julie Klingenstein Family Fund and the Cousins Foundation. So many thanks to them for, so for providing the funds uh, to be able to, to make this happen. Thank you to, your, uh, to our incredible audience and for the wonderful questions. And um, we really appreciate your time today. And um, the people at the Religious Freedom Center, um, our, our wonderful um, hosts here, will have our contact information. And so if any of you are interested in connecting with us, um, we'd be very happy to have conversations and to support you along the journey. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye.